Let's hear it for Elizabeth and Elizabeth. Very nicely done. I love it. It's so, it's so great. This whole thing is kind of spontaneous, you know, and it's wonderful to have everybody here. Uh, I'm Paul Lavasser uh, with the Transition Movement, and uh, we're going to talk about a, a few things briefly and then get right into our storytelling, which is what this evening is about. It's really a celebration uh, for the Community Garden Project that is now underway across from the co-op, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit and how tell the very brief story about how all of that started and who's responsible for it, uh, and, and also make some acknowledge, acknowledgments. But um, let's see. Uh, Transition Putney. What is Transition Putney in a sentence or two? Uh, Transition Putney is really uh, a, a movement that recognizes uh, the triple challenges of peak oil, climate change, and economic instability. Uh, but at the same time that we know that those challenges are out there, what this movement is really about is finding hope and opportunity uh, in, the, in the circumstances in which we uh, currently exist. So it's really about uh, developing and building and celebrating community. Uh, it's more like a party than a protest. Uh, it's really uh, getting people excited about taking charge for creating a community that we love uh, and that we can live into. Uh, so that's transition uh, in a nutshell. Uh, and I can say from personal experience that uh, this has been one of the most exciting times that I've had uh, just because it's kind of given me an opportunity to work with other people to, to create uh, and to put into action dreams that we have inside of ourselves. Uh, those dreams that we rarely have an opportunity to talk about with other people. Uh, those dreams that, that live in us uh, that don't necessarily come alive uh, but certainly can come alive if given the opportunity and particularly the support of a group of people who share a vision uh, for a community and a neighborhood uh, and relationships uh, and work toward creating those, making those happen. So that's what transition is about. Uh, so, uh, some of the things that we're doing in transition now, just for you know, just so that you know, we have the Community Garden Project, uh, we have a greenhouse, neighborhood greenhouse project. If you're interested in, the, in a greenhouse in your neighborhood, see Simone. Where is Simone? Simone? Yeah. Simone's in charge of that project. Uh, we're also doing reskilling workshops. Reskilling workshops are uh, basically learning kind of the old trades. You know, we really need to bring in people uh, who have learn these skills which we, I, and many of us have forgotten over the years. Uh, how to can, uh, how to do fermentation, preserve our food, grow gardens, get a community garden out there and start growing our own food. Um, so we'll be doing reskilling workshops, how to make soap, how to make cheese, simple cheese, how to grow our own food. We'll be doing two of those a month, 22 over the next year. Uh, really exciting project. And we'll also be having speakers and films on a monthly basis. We'll be having forums on a monthly basis here in the library where people talk about what they would like to create in our town together uh, and a variety of other things, which you'll hear about. So uh, that's transition and where we are at this point. I think we should acknowledge that. So today, since we're about celebration, really, transition is about celebration, I really want to celebrate and acknowledge uh, the community garden project that is underway and the people who have made this happen. First of all, Marshall Leader uh, and the Gateway Group. Those are the landowners. Uh, and they immediately, when we asked them, I heard back in two days, we absolutely support that project. But how did the project come to be in the beginning? And it came to be when uh, we did a transition, transition event right here in the library. Hans Estrin was here. Maybe some people were here. Uh, and at the end of that session, 
which was quite dynamic and exciting. Uh, there was a person in the back of the room uh, who's with us right now, Howard Prusak. <laughs> and Howie stood up and he said, what I would like to see in this town is a community garden, correct me if I'm wrong, a community <laughs> garden in that field across from the co-op. And he said, and I will plow the field myself. And everyone applauded. They thought it was a terrific idea. And so it seemed like there was a lot of buy-in. So the transition group got together and contacted Marsha Leader, and the whole project unfolded. He's excited. <laughs> and Howie came down, and we were actually thinking of postponing the project. Uh, until next year, it seemed kind of late in the season. And Howie, do you want to say what you said to us and why it was so important to start? Well, it was, it, for me it was real simple. People are hungry now. People want to eat now. I, I don't know anyone who wants to wait till next year to eat. Does anyone here want to wait till next year to eat? Anyone? <laughs> All right, that case was closed. We did the garden. And there's, there's plants there now. Absolutely. So let's hear it for Howie. <laughs> So true to his word, he brought uh, his plow down and plowed the field. Uh, and then uh, Margie Levine from the Putney School came down and harrowed the field. And uh, following that, she rode it tilled where the community garden spaces are. And then Deb and Charlie Titus, unbelievable sweet tree farm. They gave us 22 yards of composted manure. Right. 22 <laughs> yards. <laughs> normally, normally, they give away six yards at a time. Unbelievable. Uh, and Ellis and Rick Derrick and Kenny, uh, who drove the truck, got the dump truck and went and picked that up. At last minute, we called them so that it was ready on Saturday to start planting. Uh, and Paul Putnam from the uh, Brown and Roberts Hardware provided the hoses that we need to get water uh, across the street to the gardens. Absolutely essential. So, um, uh, three other people I'd like to recognize in particular Daniel Hovis. Where is Daniel? He has worked untiringly to make this happen. Unbelievable. This guy is passionate and uh, nonstop. Uh, really terrific work. And uh, Simone helped a lot too in sowing the buckwheat. Uh, and Charlie and Laurel uh, helped with that too. So these are the folks that made this happen. Let's hear it. And of the 20 plots that we have staked out, all 20 are spoken for as of yesterday, and wow. we're thinking of adding one or two more. So. so in six days, 20 people signed up for the 20 plots available. Pretty amazing. Less than a week. Uh, so uh, this is an amazing community. I mean, it's amazing what we can do. We really started on this project about three weeks ago. Is that right, Howie? When did you plan? Yeah. In three weeks, we put together this amazing garden. So. What can't we do? That's my question. What do we want to do, and how do we mobilize ourselves to do it? So uh, let's start with the stories. And, and the reason uh, we decided to go with stories is because um, stories are a way of tapping into our values as a community. Uh, stories are a way of connecting with those things that we don't normally talk about. It's those things that we long for, that we care about, that give us pleasure, that, that touch us in a deep way. And so I've been uh, sitting in st uh, story circles at SIT and other places. I I've sat in hundreds of story circles. And, um, and my experience in those circles is when I listen to a story, if I truly listen to the story, it's my story. It's not just the story of the storyteller. And that there's wisdom in that story, and there's longing in that story, and there's a deep desire to live a meaningful life. And so these stories are an opportunity for all of us to tap into that part of ourselves. So I, I ask you, I suggest that you listen deeply, not only to the story being told, but the story that's responding inside yourself. So let's begin. Oh, yes. Uh, Margaret, do you want to come up? 
Just for the people who are going to be telling their stories, I'll hold this up when, when you have 30 seconds left. <laughs> 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 Wrap up, Molly. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, just a little prompt so that people know uh, approximately how far they are in the process. So three minutes per story, not a long time. Uh, but let's listen to each of these stories. And we're going to introduce people with just a sentence, okay? And Marilyn Loomis uh, is going to help me do that. Why don't you let people get seated? Yes. Anyone need a chair? Anybody else? So, Marilyn, do you want to come up and introduce our first star? I think everybody can hear me, but you didn't tell me who to start. Oh. Yeah. I don't have a list. Does <laughs> so anyone have a list? Okay. I don't either. We'll get them. We'll pass them up. Okay, I got it. Um, it's hard to say in one sentence about somebody. I'm going to lose a lot of commas. Uh, Laurel Ellis is our first person. She's a great friend, fantastic gardener, artist, traveling companion, uh, consignment shop owner, historical society member, community club worker, and I'm leaving the list up to her. It's a long sentence, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was glad to see that Paul isn't going to be using one of those hooks that get people on. <laughs> Three minutes are up. Well, I gotta, I'm going to wire you now. Oh, thanks for telling me what to do. Pull this way. Am I on? Okay, I am going to read my story, and I apologize, but it's the only way I can do it in three minutes without wandering or stumbling. So I came to tell you a little brief history of the Kai's Garden, which is now the Ellis Garden, where I live. Once upon a time in 1840, 170 years ago, James Kai's and his bride, Laura Houghton, bought a house next to the New Methodist Church on Putney's new Main Street. James was a businessman who owned and operated at different times the woolen mill, the tavern, because his wife, Laura, was Asa Houghton's daughter, and the corner store that we now know as the general store. He designed formal gardens on the terraced one-half acre lot at his new home and uh, kept them going for many years. It was a long, thin strip that went from the street up to the woods. James and Laura's only surviving daughter, Carolyn, Caroline, remained in the home after her parents' passing and acquired an additional half acre from the neighbors to the south so she could expand the gardens. She also acquired spring rights from three or four springs in the hills so that water could be piped down to water them. Carolyn's good friend, Rudyard Kipling, loved to come and stroll with her through her gardens, and he is said to have copied the design in his garden in Sussex, England. I know you can't see this, but I'll leave it where you can glance at it later. This is, this is her garden design. Um, shortly after my husband Doug and I bought the property in 1993, and we were the first purchasers since 1840, <coughs> Elaine Dixon brought us a copy of, of this article from the Historical Society, which appeared in a, a 1910 magazine. The article contained a wonderful description of Carolyn Kai's garden as it was at that time, and has served as a great inspiration as I continue my efforts to keep the space pleasing. After Carolyn's death in eight, 1918, she bequeathed the property to her housekeeper, Kate Foley. My mother-in-law, who grew up in Putney as Winnie Brooks, remembered Kate's gardens as encompassing the entire lower portion of the property with just little paths winding through. And uh, Ms. Foley left the property to her brother Mike, who passed it on to Muriel Cray, his daughter. And by the time we bought the property 50 years later, the gardens had suffered, suffered many years of neglect. 
As I began creating new beds, I found many flowers that were surviving among the weeds that were mentioned in this article, now 100 years old. The survivors included daffodils, myrtle, Japanese iris, forget-me-not, old lemon lily, phlox, aster, canterbury bell, and daylily, which I suspect is what I call the tiger lily, syringa, and lilac. There are also many spring bulbs that bloom in masses when they have spread uh, snowdrops and wood hyacinths. And there's a beautiful patch of old pink roses that are blooming right now that I rescued from the tiger lilies and an old-fashioned double white rose on the first level. There was also a great forest of airlock hollyhocks, which fell victim to something last year, and I hope they come back. It's also descendants of a large butternut tree uh, that we had to cut down when we first bought the property, but they keep trying to grow. Part of the fun of being the current caretaker of the space is finding artifacts from the past as I work the soil. Many china and pottery fragments, pieces of lead or stone water pipes, pieces of clay <coughs> smoking pipes, old buttons, and many marbles lost by the Cray boys in the 1950s. My major additions to the garden has been about 70 new colors of daylilies, which are just beginning this season's blooming. Everyone is welcome to stop in and enjoy them for the next six weeks or so, any time. And while you're there, you can try to imagine how the space looked in bygone years. Our next storyteller is Ruth Sessions. Thank you, right over here, uh, I can say just a couple of things about Ruth. Ruth is the farm manager at Sun Ledge Farm, with them top of uh, Sun Hill Road, corner of Watpon Road. Uh, she has been gardening, I know, uh, for years and years and years because we grew up together. I met Ruth when I was uh, 14 years old, I Young think. Young and handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and she's a great storyteller, and here she is. Is this good? No, it, this is no wait. Oh, you're recording. <clears throat> Can you still read it? <laughs> okay. You haven't started timing yet, have you? <laughs> this is a little bit like bringing coals to Newcastle, I think. <clears throat> talking about gardening in Putney. But anyway, let's see. I'm always interested to hear what comes out. Um, dirt. Dirt is uh, of very, very, very intense interest to me, and I think that may be because I spent the first, let's see, how old are you in second grade? Eight? Seven. Seven. Oh, well, uh, more than that then, probably <laughs> up to fourth grade, on my hands and knees. I crawled a lot. In fact, I perfected all the gates of horses because I was in love with horses. And, um, <laughs> I, don't, I like your shirts. I want to be able to see. <laughs> Are you enjoying this? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, so I was running around on my hands and knees a lot, and I think what happened was that I was just on the ground a lot, and I went under bushes. I was uh, several different kinds of animals, and. Um, I just love the ground. I love poking around in it. I love digging in it. I love making holes and seeing what's in there. I love putting things in the ground, watching them come up. And to me, that's kind of the essence of gardening. Now, I suppose you need a little water. I'm very interested in creating soil and catching water. And once I've got both of those and a few seeds, I'm ready to go. Um, I think I discovered that soil could actually be well, I don't create it, obviously. I'm sort of a, uh, I'm not even a coach. What would I be, like a... Conductor. Like a birth person. Who are those ladies that... A midwife. A midwife. Yeah, you know, I put the, I put the ingredients together and then I kind of wait, add a little water and um, green stuff and brown stuff starts heating up and after a while it becomes soil. Now that's pretty simplified, but... Um, 
it works and you get really good stuff and from that you get really good stuff like flowers which I adore and food which I love to eat um, it's pretty simple and it's very complicated it's starting to get more complicated as I learn how much I don't know which happens after a while you probably have that experience you know you start with something and wow it's really easy I'm cooking I'm cooking and then stuff starts happening and you're trying to catch this and you're trying to catch that oh my gosh why did those die and why are these alive I was sure they were going to die and they didn't so <laughs> then you begin to really follow an amazing amazing system which is all over this planet if we are careful it'll stay that way or keep evolving um, I don't know that I have much more to say except that it is a, a passion for me and I love talking about it and I love sharing it with people and teaching people things about it and encouraging people, little people, which I was as a beginning gardener. In fact, I had a garden that my mother gave me on our property and I made a little wonderland. I went out in the woods and got... Um, stuff to plant in it like jack in the pulpits and I made a frog pool out of an old sink and I got it all fixed up and I sprayed it all with water after I swept all the stones off and made them neat not as neat anymore and I think I'm growing more edible things than I did then but do it do it every day even during the winter if you possibly can because we need it <coughs> and you all look like good gardeners to me Thank you. Oh, just one more thing. I have a dozen guinea eggs if anyone wants to try them. They're three bucks a dozen. They're fabulous. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, down lower. And this is Sarah West. Sarah West uh, works in the deli at the Putney Co-op. And she is now the manager of uh, the Putney Community Garden. And so she's in charge. Well, if I can garden, anyone can garden, <laughs> I've decided. Um, you know, my mom had little herb gardens around when I was young, uh, so anytime I see rosemary or basil or smell them or eat them, I think of home, it's very comforting. Uh, she also had some chives along the, along the path that my sister and I used to tell our friends was grass, and we would eat on it and say, here, you want some grass? And they'd be like, ew, no. So I carried that with me, but I never really got my hands in the dirt until about four years ago. And um, I've been dirty ever since. <laughs> I can't stop. Um, I started, I lived, I grew up in Iowa, and this is where I started growing food. I got really into uh, natural food stores. I was working in a co-op there and um, really got into the local food movement. And so I thought, I got to give this a shot. I got to try it out. So I was really excited. I had all these little, you know, the little starter trays and started all these plants. And I call home. I'm like, Mom, check it out. I started tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and cucumbers and carrots. And she said, Honey, carrots? And I said, Yeah. And she said, You don't start those in the trays. They don't transplant. <laughs> They're like wispy. They don't work. So I was like, Oh. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. And I ended up, whatever, whatever grew up out of those things, some of them grew, some of them didn't. It was totally a trial, and a lot of it failed. But the ones that did grow, I ended up giving to her, and we put them in her garden. It was very sweet. So um, anyway, it was kind of a rough beginning. But ever since then, I just I have fallen in love with it. I took a permaculture course, so I had a whole summer where I had a plot to myself, we had communal garden space, we had herbs growing around the house, we had just like, it was a food forest. We had these trees with plants growing around it, so it was all biodiverse and happy together. And um, I learned a lot that year, and I, I started gardening for other people, so that I couldn't even believe that people would pay me 
to play in the dirt. Um, but it works, and I've learned a lot. There are a lot of um, cycles in nature that we can learn from just if we watch, just if we sit in the garden, you know, and notice the bees coming around. You can see so very much in just a little bit there. My favorite part um, about the garden, actually, which some of you may give me, a, you know, the furrowed eyebrow for, my favorite part are the weeds. I'm noticing as I'm, I've been really, you know, I've been helping people out in their garden spaces and I, I just, I do what they tell me to, but they're asking me, you know, if I would pull out the weeds and I find that I know the names of the weeds more than I know the names of the actual flowers they have planted. So I'm pulling up jewel weed and I know that that's, you know, ah, oh, like this is helpful when you have poison ivy. You can rub that on your skin right away. It takes the essential, or it takes the oils off. And I know red clover, if you harvest the blossoms, it's the best anti-cancer remedy there is. It will dissolve cysts and tumors. And I know that dandelion, if you harvest the root or the leaves, that it's good for you know, the digestive system and for the liver and for breaking things down. There are all of these hidden secrets in nature. And for me, it doesn't have to be pristine. It doesn't have to look beautiful though I prefer that it does. But beauty comes in many packages. And you can, you can learn a lot from the wildness that there is. So, um, yeah, have fun and, and get into the imperfection. That's the beauty of it. You threw me off, Paul. Sorry. <laughs> Sarah has to leave now. Okay, okay. I thought Thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you. Sarah. <laughs> and come see me at the co op in the deli if you're interested in a community garden space or if you're involved and you want to talk or you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, next, we have Ramona Lawrence. And when I think of Ramona, I think of the uh, large apple orchards that used to be. Uh, she's a dedicated volunteer around town always helping the elderly, always willing worker, always cheerful, and very happy to be here. Perfect. <laughs> Well, thank you for asking me to come. It's, uh, it's an honor. I thank you. I was going to tell you about the history. Uh, Marilyn asked me to talk about the Putney Nursery. I was going to talk about history, but I think I'm going to mix in a little bit something else. You're talking about your plants. As the young lady said before, every plant, whether it's a weed, out of the garden, anywhere, out of its wild, civilized, whatever, it's got a purpose. Sometimes you have to look pretty hard for them, but it's out there, even <laughs> garlic mustard. <laughs> but anyway, it's going back to the nursery. I had been raised on a farm, so I was close to the earth anyway. But when, when I got old enough to go out to get a job, I come up and started working for Mr. Bryant. I only worked part-time at first. And then after, after a certain length of time, I worked full-time. And they were wonderful people to work for. They taught me a lot. I was taught about plants when I was home. But this was hands-on stuff at the nursery. Some of it, it was hot and dirty and <laughs> discouraging. But I learned an awful lot. It opened up a lot of doors for me. Now I can see so many plants. And I have a scrapbook at home that is pictures from the nursery, wild plants. And I treasure that book. And I found most all of them, not all of them, but most all of them, out in the wild. I love to try, I travel around, hike around anyway. That gives me darn good reason. But it is, it's a wondrous world out there. If you just get out there and open your eyes, and don't, don't just, just don't look, see. Uh, don't get me on my soapbox. <laughs> but no, it's, uh, as you say, 
And I think it's great that you're getting the garden started out here. As far as the nursery is concerned, my mother will work for Senator, uh, well, Governor, Senator Aiken. She was up to Claire Wilson's old house. That's why she started making wreaths. She was, wasn't married at that time. And that was, would be probably, oh Lord, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago. Then when uh, she come down here, she worked for Alice Holloway. And <laughs> in fact, the first nursery uh, packing shed, when the road was up there, and stood it down here, mm -hmm. set in the middle of the road, down by the uh, fire station. <laughs> Wasn't much of a packing shed, but I very vaguely remember that one. But it was, it was a packing shed. And then Mr. Bryant took it over. Well, it was, there was another gentleman in between. But Mr. Bryant took it over, and he developed what I remember. And he had quite a, quite a layout there. It was fun working for him. He was the kind of guy that he was family, and that was it. So, and I think I have stood on my soapbox about long enough. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ramona. Uh, the next person is Virginia Scholl. Uh, Virginia Scholl is a dance uh, teacher, professor uh, at Landmark College. Uh, she's also uh, a Tai Chi practitioner. So I think I was drafted to do something in dance with <laughs> gardens, which I will do, and Elizabeth is going to come help me do it. But before I do that, since I'm here, I have to tell a story or two. So I'll tell a very short story, and the dance will be very short. Um, but I, Ramona mentioned Alice Hallway, and I just wanted to tell a little story about her because when we first moved to our house, I live um, with Ken Pick in the old cape that's across from the Putney Central School. It says Ken Pick Pottery. And when we first moved there in 1977 or 78, there were no gardens there. And, and we knew Alice was this wonderful gardener, had run the Putney Nursery and had wonderful gardens in her place. So we invited her to come walk the the grounds with us and give us ideas what we could do with it. And so she walked around with us and she said, well, you could put some things here and made a few suggestions. And then she said, but you know, if, if I were you, I wouldn't put too many gardens in because they're a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> and you might be sorry. <laughs> and that was really good advice that we paid no attention to whatsoever. <laughs> but I think of it often when I feel overwhelmed by our gardens. And one reason our garden grew was because, another community story, was because there was a man named Tom, I think Tom Angle at Putney School, at, Put at Greenwood School. That's People, right, Greenwood School. Yeah, he was hybridizing um, daylilies. He had an amazing collection of daylilies that he had hybridized and officially um, patented or whatever you do, uh, registered or something. And, um, and then he got tr a job in Texas, and he couldn't take his daylilies with him to Texas. So he had a whole, he opened his garden and invited the whole community to come see his daylilies and then he started giving them away. And he took a great liking to my son Yasha who was interested in hybridizing at that point in his life. Now he's interested in pigs, but then it was <laughs> daylilies. So he actually named a daylily after Yasha Pick, which was very exciting. It's registered daylily. It's purple, it's really pretty. It's in my garden if you want to come see it. He named daylilies after a lot of Putney people. Like um, Karen Engel's mother has Emma Engel Daylily, I think. There are probably, I don't know if anybody here with a Daylily named after you, but it's, that's kind of a neat thing. Anyway, he, for some reason, because I guess he liked Yasha, he um, called us one day and said, I need to get rid of these. Come bring your truck, and I'll give you some. And he, he, two truckloads of Daylilies <laughs> arrived at our house at the end of July, just before the Sunapee Craft Fair. So we sort of plowed up some field and stuck them in the ground. And then we had to make gardens to put all these daylilies in. So in July, our, our gardens bloom with these incredible daylilies, all, pretty much all of which came from Tom Engel. So they're really a gift from the community. And if any of you want to stop by and see them <laughs> in July, they're really, it's really quite a showing. There's, oh my god, I haven't done my dance yet. Um, OK, shall I do it or not skip it? OK, so what I, let's, um, what I was going to just do is a little bit of um, 
And we have a Tai Chi class that meets in Putney at the Putney Friends meeting. A wonderful community gathering of wonderful women. Elizabeth's part of it. CL2 Express, our teacher. And we always start, we do a uh, what, five circle form that's a little different from the Tai Chi that most people study around here. But the first thing we always do is called the five elements. Shall we do the five Gathering elements? Gathering the five elements. Gathering the five elements. And it's very, it sort of it has to do with the sun and the wood and the water and the earth minerals. and the minerals and the earth. And so I thought we would just, we'll just show you, it's actually a really nice thing to do in the middle of your garden because it takes you around, you get to see your whole garden as you do it. So this is the way it goes. So well, we'll start, well, let's just start with, so the first thing is you gather in the energy, which is like gathering, you can do this with me if you want, gathering in the energy and then um, letting it go. And then you take a step back, oh no, I, I did it wrong. Anyway, take a step back, oh, and, and bring up, the earth and the sky together and call them down so they meet each other and then stepping forward you gather up the energy from the sun, the fire energy and then feel the rain washing down and then you move around, this lovely part, moment to see your whole garden, you move around in a circle. This is the a salute to the element of wood but it's like gathering in all the energies of the garden and then the energy of the minerals in the soil on one side. It's also a nice time to look at the trees growing <laughs> the other side and let them sift through and mix up and then what is this? Release them to the earth. Oh, release them to the earth or the sky and bring them back down to the earth and then gather them up again and let it all go. And this at the end she said, today she said, and this is when you pick up in your hands all the things you have to do and this is the best part. And then you separate and let them go. And you're finished. <laughs> and then you salute your garden. <laughs> Here we have the two Elizabeths, one with an S and one with a Z. Got it. Uh, and um, Elizabeth Dearborn moved here about a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, two years ago. Great to have you here for so long. And uh, Elizabeth Christie's been in this area for a long time. Uh, they uh, have been working with a wonderful organization, Post Tomorrow Solutions, and doing gardening uh, in their uh, backyard over at the Putney Commons. Thank you, dear. Um, we came to Putney two years ago, as Anne Fines, who many of you know, maybe now eight years ago, had this vision that it would be nice to have a place in downtown Putney with a south-facing field where you could walk everywhere. And at that point, they wanted to have a senior retirement community. Well, as the years went by and they found the land, Hilda Marie Hendricks sold them 11 acres right behind the, the Catalpa House and the community center um, there. Um, about 50, 60 people came in and out of considering it, and finally six of us committed, and we built the houses that now are there. There's six houses, there are three more, and we have a few brochures if you want to do it and uh, look at them. One of the exciting things for us all of us was that leaving behind houses where we lived at the end of old dirt roads or in suburban areas in Tacoma Park, Maryland, um, and learning to live together in, a, in a small houses, independent houses, um, environmentally sensitive, energy efficient, and to plan together about this land of ours. And we have built a garden April or July 4th was the day our garden was ready for us last year. We had the big community <coughs> garden where we had nine by 12 plots, 12 of them. And we put a fence around it to discourage the deer. And um, we had marvelous harvests. So those of you who are planting back here and starting in late June, prepare yourself for a wonderful harvest um, next, next fall. Um, and we have since expanded that garden. We have an out of the fence garden 
um, where we're going to be raising some, where we are raising some potatoes and onions for the um, food shelf, which meets at the community center every week. And who knows where we're going to go next? Well, so uh, one of the advantages we had is because we were uh, doing a garden in a construction zone, all the topsoil had been moved to a particular pile. So we had Rick Derrick move the topsoil back into the mounded area and brought in truckloads of manure from Sweet Tree in order to make a fairly good uh, mix. And then uh, we also gathered the leaves from the back of the Putney Community Center every year there are teenagers who gather it up and so we just said could you you know take your bags over to our garden and leave them there so in that way we have a massive uh, worm producing area and uh, we realized at the end of the first year that there was plenty of leftover topsoil and we could get mulch and so we've now put in a second garden that uh, the, most of the food for that is going to the food pantry so we are enjoying the process very much of being a, 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 a community creating a garden. It was Henry Homeyer's 9 by 12 uh, workshop uh, last year that got us started in, in a, so each of us has a 9 by 12 to work with. Uh, each of us has two 9 by 12s to work with. And one of the fun things is watching each other's gardens and learning from them because we have vastly different levels of experiences and inexperience. Thank you. And next we have uh, Wendy Raymond. Uh, Wendy's uh, from the Putney area, from Putney itself, from Putney Central School. Uh, she's now working at the Putney Community Center doing amazing things over there, uh, programs for kids and uh, adults, and she's going to tell us a story about gardening. I get to clip myself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I just share a few memories about gardening. When I was in second grade, we had this really fun homework project where we took home an egg carton and we had to find 12 seeds to fill it and glue them into the bottom. And I was like freaking out. I didn't know where I'd find 12 seeds, but then mom was cooking dinner and I went and hassled her because she helped me with all my homework. And we found tomato seeds, we found pepper seeds, we found seeds in the spice jars, celery seed, and all sorts of fun. So we filled up the egg carton, no problem. And then my teachers were awesome and they also had us bring in carrot tops and potato eyes. Like, you know, when you leave the potatoes in the sack too long and they grow really cool. Uh, stuff off them. We got to cut those off and bring them into class. We had the windows still covered with like yogurt dishes and stuff with water and the carrot tops and potato eyes and we grew them. And I think we did beans too and we got to take them home and mom was always into gardening and she had like flower beds and she got really mad when the mailman stepped over them. But um, <laughs> she always had the gardens around and um, my grandparents were also really into it and I remember my grandpa one day we were walking outside and he took me by the garden he pulled up carrots out of the ground just yoinked his carrots and he gave us some and they were the best carrots I've ever tasted and he also did berries and he kept the berry patch um, in the back of his house and we go picking all the time and then when we moved to Putney in the back of our house there's an old logging trail and we picked blackberries all along and mom started a garden and I'd help with that and I'm still helping with the garden harvested a ton of rhubarb um, I'm really excited about the community gardens going on and um, thinking about Gardening more in the future. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, our next storyteller is Am Amelia Bruce. Uh, wonderful to have her with us. Uh, she taught uh, Spanish uh, for many years at Putney School. Uh, and it's a delight to have her here with us today. Well, I was a city person for 23 years. 19 years in Madrid, and the other three were in Mexico. 
But I think that the country ways, the countryside, and the earth was inside of me, and probably I inherited from my ancestors, because it's Spain is an agricultural country, was completely agricultural, with a few places where there were industries. But where my family came from was south of Madrid. Consequently, I had this love always for the country. My first experience in the country, real country, is when I was 14 years old, and I went to visit a friend of mine whose family had incredible amount of property, incredible amount of animals, and they grew uh, grains. The interesting thing about this place is that in spite of all so much wealth of products, they didn't have a bathroom. <laughs> so coming from the city was incredible, but of course, everything was huge, so they didn't need a bathroom. <laughs> well, that is helpful. And then, every time that I went to the country, I just loved it. I just felt very close to it, and so was my family. My mother never lost her country ways. She was born in Madrid, my grandparents also, but she was really a peasant inside. And by that I mean, she loved the simplicity of life. There was no vanity about her. She didn't care much about fancy clothing. And when I asked her, well, I, it didn't bother me that much. It bothered my sisters, who used to tell her mother, why don't you get other clothes, the one you have in the closet. And her answer used to be, a habit doesn't make a monk. <laughs> I thought that that was very wise, and I'm very happy that some of my children had inherited some of her genes. So, after that, I went to Mexico. I live in Mexico City, and I also went to the countryside, and I was really very interested in the fields where the corn was grown together with the frijoles or the beans and the zucchinis, and how they complemented so well. And then out of a very small pot that is pets and hot, they could create a self-sufficient life as far as eating food, and then love it also doing it. Nowadays, things are very different. They would like to go to a place where the, the children can be educated. Am I finished? 30 seconds. Very sick. Okay, okay. Well, I better forget that. Okay, so I just spent a lot of time in the country. I didn't have a garden, but my family had a garden. And when I came to Padney, I spent a tremendous amount of time freezing vegetables, which I loved it, especially when the winter came and you have to eat it. It was just a wonderful thing. So what I did, Paul asked me, could you find some poems that had to do with gardening? And believe me, what I was looking for was a poem that would start with the seeds and the water and the growing of the seed and bringing it into your house and enjoying the food, etc., etc. But I was looking for one that would say something that gave sense to those people who cultivate those things and they are being sold in markets and we take it for granted that it's just a vegetable and we forget the word that goes into it. And I think that we should have, we should have a reverence for that. So because I have a strong accent, I asked my friend, Ann Carey, to read this poem by Wendell Berry. And then I hope we have time to read. I will read a poem by Pablo Neruda that is called Ode to a Tomato. <laughs> but I, I really, I really, I'm very excited when I saw the field across the corn plow. That makes me feel very happy. And I want to dedicate these two points to the people who are doing that work. I just saw this this afternoon, and we'll see how it goes. Sowing the seed, my hand is one with the earth. Wanting the seed to grow, my mind is one with the light. Hoeing the crop, my hands are one with the rain. Having cared for plants, my mind is one with the air. 
hungry and trusting, my mind is one with the earth. Eating the fruit, my body is one with the earth. Wendell Berry. Also. Well, I don't know. You probably, many of you know about Pablo Medita, don't you? Mm-hmm. Well, he wrote a series of poems called Elemental Oaks. And it's about every subject that you can imagine. Hmm? The air, the soil, the cascade, well, the numerous ones. And this is Oat to a Tomato. Can you get the mic a little closer? Oat to a tomato. Okay. Do I hold that? Do I hold it? Put it, put it on her. You can hold on it. the street at noon, tomatoes everywhere in summer. Daylight splits into a tomato's equal halves. Its juice flows in the streets in December. That is because in December is summer there. The tomatoes are on the move. They raid kitchens, show up for lunch, (laughs) or perch with dignity on on shelves, alongside glasses, butter dishes, and blue salt shakers. Tomatoes have their own glow and a benign grandeur. At the same, we will have to put this one to death. The knife sinks into its living pulp. Its bloody organ, a poignant row, in a sociable sun. In Chile, tomato completes the salad. In a cheerful wedding, with the bright onions, in celebration of this union, we agree to pour oil of a spring, of a spring, of the olive essence, over its yawning halves. Ness, pepper adds its fragrance, and soul its magnetic touch. That is the day's wedding. Parsley raises its standards, potatoes boil energetically, and the roast sense is its aroma, knocking at the door. Mm-hmm. It is ready. Here we go. And there it is. On the table at the summer's equator, a tomato, a tomato, an earthen sphere, a fertile and repeated star reveals its folds and channels, its renowned fullness, its abundance free of pits and peels, thorns and scales. It is the tomato's gift to us, this fiery color and undiminished freshness. I had a little song, the first part of the song, about vegetables, but it's not out. It's not out. <laughs> East Putney Community Club or Pierce's Hall and all the reconstruction that he has been in charge of over there with the contra dances. Um, he has the greatest smile that I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, he's a real worker. Um, he, he's always willing to do anything above and beyond what you ask him. He has a very interesting car. Uh, uh, I didn't know he was a gardener. Sorry. <laughs> and um, there is a contra dance Saturday night. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, so if you know me or if you read my article in the local banquet, you might imagine I'm going to be talking about um, why vegetables love urine so much and we should all pee in our gardens, which I firmly believe, but I can tell you about that later. It takes an hour probably. Um, I want to talk instead to tell a story about why my garden looks like such a mess. And uh, it goes back about 10 years to when I first started traveling to Central America, thanks largely to Amelia, who helped me learn Spanish. And, um, and I started on a study abroad, abroad trip, and my interest was in gardening because I'd been um, 
working, I've been running a, a community, no, a kitchen garden for the school cafeteria, trying to keep it immaculate and keep the weeds down and keep the rows straight and all that. And really enjoyed it. And so I got to um, southern Mexico and I, I met up with some farmers and, and they were generous enough to take me to their farms and gardens and teach me about how they grew things there. And one of the, um, one of the places I went, it was a walk out of, um, out of town because a lot of these a lot of these plots were far from where people lived. We walked on the road, we walked in the forest for a while, and it was, it was quite a track. And finally, the trail we were following sort of petered out in this, this um, sort of overgrown, tangled clearing. And I thought, oh, how are we going to get across this? And how much further is it to the farm anyway? And the guy said, well, here we are. And uh, this is my farm. And it was all full of like tangled vines and, and just explosive growth. and and things that, that did not look like a gar garden at all to me. It looked like a riot, is what it looked like. But sure enough, there were some corn plants in it. There were some, um, some squash plants, chilies, beans, viney things I didn't recognize. And he went around just pulling things up out of the ground. It wouldn't even be anything. The plant would have died, but he knew where to go. He's like a magician pulling rutabagas out of a hat, except they were strange tropical tubers. And uh, we brought, it, they brought them back and ate them, and they were great. But it really just turned on my head my eye my idea of what a garden should look like. And, um, and I liked it because it was so sort of wild, even though it was cultivated and things were planted and he knew where everything was, the, um, the farm and, and the gardens had this sort of internal life of their own that was not planned on top of what was planned. So I've kind of taken that to heart and in my own garden, I, um, I don't keep it nearly as straight as I used to and I'm kind of lazy on purpose. And I have milkweed coming up from underground roots that I I beat it down every year so it doesn't take over, but I, I don't really kill it. And so it comes up and I let the butterflies have that. And plants will bolt sometimes. And if I don't have something I want to put right there that I need the space for, I'll let the lettuce get six feet tall and feed the bugs and, and be this kind of living thing that I'm sure is pumping good stuff into the soil and helping condition the soil. I don't want to rip it out and leave bare dirt. So I leave that. And as a result, my garden is this sort of lumpy, textured, overgrown sort of thing that I pull all kinds of stuff out of it. I can get a great salad out of there, but it's not something you look at and think, he must be a good gardener. You look at it and think, where's he been for the last month? <laughs> but it's the way I like it, and, um, and I, I feel that, that it's an aesthetic that I enjoy, and, and hopefully now that you've heard, you won't, uh, you won't just see it and think that I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Thank you. Great. So our next storyteller is Nye Farabas, thank you very much. And uh, Nye has been with us for a long time. She attended Putney School. Uh, she's an artist. Uh, just had a recent uh, installation uh, show at the Putney School. Uh, and she is a gardener, too. Well, I used to, uh, what, do you, what, would, what would you say, a once and future gardener. <laughs> Not right now. Thank you. Can, can you hear OK? Um, probably the most important garden experience that I ever had was when I was three. And um, I was given a piece of a potato and a very small onion. And I put them in the ground and I took care of them. And every day I went to see what was happening and pretty soon some leaves came up and pretty soon shoots were, you know, it, it, it was just absolute magic. And um, I've, I've never forgotten that. And it, it, it's an experience that every kid ought to have, I think. Um, later on, probably a couple or three years in maybe nursery school, it was um, sprouting sunflowers on the windowsill. And we put them in wet paper towels. And then we watched the uh, the. the the root come out one end and the shoot come out the other and then the two leaves open and that was that was great. Um, <clears throat> in World War II, it was a victory garden and um, everybody who had any land at all was growing their own food because there were green stamps for one kind of food and blue stamps for canned food and red stamps for meat and you know it was it was like um, you really had to pay attention and uh, we saved 
when, when we were able to get meat and there was fat left, we saved that and we made soap. Um, the, the gardening that I remember at that point was um, <clears throat> we had a, a rubber hose and it didn't stretch all the way from the house to the garden. So we were lugging pails of water and lugging pails of water and um, indeed we had a garden and we had fresh produce. Um, I'll skip over a bit and, and uh, get to Putney School where I really discovered what farming was and uh, you know like picking a half a mile, pulling a half a mile of carrots and uh, <laughs> it seemed like that. And then there was another half mile next to it <laughs> and uh, there, were, there were some really important things I learned there like when you're uh, when the potatoes have been um, harrowed or whatever it is that they do to bring them to the surface, then you have to go along with a gunny sack and you have to hold it open with your elbow while you're putting the potatoes into the gunny sack, which gets very heavy. Um, there's another use for an elbow in gardening or in at least uh, produced food, and that is when you want to drink cider out of a gallon jug. You don't do this, you're apt to spill it all over your front. You do it, you put your, uh, I forget which finger, I think it's this one, through the, through the little, the little uh, bale and you, and you lift the whole thing like that and then you can control the pitch. <laughs> Very important. Um, my, let's see, in, in, New York City, it was in Manhattan, it was a little bit harder to, um, to garden. But I found that sprouting avocados was wonderful and I used to do topiary out of them and I would braid them and I would t tie them in knots and, oh, okay, um, <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, so anyway, uh, I had a circle garden when I moved to Brattleboro in uh, 82. And I thought, well, why does a garden have to be square? And I didn't know anything about um, uh, labyrinths, but I had almost created a labyrinth, and it was great fun, and, and it looked wonderful from the, looking down from the windows. Um, and, and it was raised beds. And now if I were to garden, the raised beds would be two feet high. Um, but I have some... Um, I have some ambitions. Uh, one is to make a bean teepee with scarlet runner beans because I always was in love with the picture of the scarlet runner beans on the packet and I never have grown them yet. Um, potato towers, which is a wonderful way to do potatoes without having to dig them out of the ground. You just dismantle the tower when it's time. And um, I also have great love for wild food, such as nettles and purslane, or pusley as people call it, and mushrooms. So that's kind of where I'm at. And I have a poem, and I'm not going to read it. I'm going to pass it around. It's, I'm, I've always been out of the box, and the poem form is out of the box, too, um, because it's made out of Morse code. So, or actually international signal code. Thank you. Next we'll hear from uh, Doug Frank. Uh, Doug is a local artist, uh, woodworker, does amazing work, uh, also just an all-around nice guy uh, who is amazing in terms of his um, commitment to people in the community. He spent uh, today with Eva, for example, uh, who just had a, a procedure. Uh, and I want to welcome uh, Doug up here. Target. 
get here. Yeah. Easy. I heard Easy you coming. Job. If that works. I think so. I'd like to serve as living proof of uh, Senor Bruce's aphorism that the habit doesn't make the monk. <laughs> 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 I came here and realized the AC was off. I was thinking about my shorts back at home. Um, this story, which I'll read, has a refrain that uh, if you'd like to take a quick Berlitz course in Creole, you can feel free to join along with the refrain. Good evening. Forgive me. English is my second language. Good evening. I will forgive me because English is my second language. I learned to garden and sing cry from my father. My old man was named Christian, no, uh, Cedric Christian Neltra. Said he was born on St. Cry in 1917. And said his first lesson in the garden was dealing with them wicked Jack Spaniel. Said he said, Douglas, why don't ever play with them? That Jack Spaniel will mash you up. And in having watched what I was doing at age three, was throwing stones, trying to hit the Jack Spaniel nest, the Jack Spaniel nest. When it landed upon the bougainvillea, the hibiscus, or the oleander, me and know what to call them plant when I was three. But I learn a little bit every day. Let me digress. St. Croix has been under seven flags. Each flag left behind a glimpse into its culture, so that presently it resembles a theme park, like Brooklyn. All cultures are represented, morphing together into a hybrid society, like the United Nations moored off in the Caribbean Sea. It remains the ultimate graft of Creole language, food, dance, and daily life. So please say this with me. Douglas, don't ever play with them Jack Spaniel. They will mash you up. <laughs> <laughs> Having little or no regard for authority, I continued throwing stones, throwing stones, throwing stones, until I hit the nest squarely with a nice straight throw. When I say all hell broke loose, that's my very first introduction to understatement. <laughs> Crying, screaming, I ran into the house bawling loudly. Ay, 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 the Jack Spaniel bite me. Ay, 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 the Jack Spaniel bite me. Not knowing that I had been stung, not bit. You kids could learn a lot about wasp safety or bees. If you get stung, put some pee on the sting right away. Try to remove the stinger, if you can, but the pee will help the sting and control the swelling. Everybody know, Douglas, don't ever play with Jack Spagna. They will mash you up. Yes. <laughs> Finally, lessons are hard to come by in the garden and outside the garden. I learned that day that sometimes you must do what you're told, <laughs> even if you want to experiment. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to hear from Mike Merwicky, uh, local musician uh, and also uh, dedicated uh, the last many years of his life to serving Putney through Putney Family Services and also in governmental positions. Mike Merwicky. It's great to be here.
before I start, let's give it up for Paul Levasseur. Yeah. Thank you, Paul, for all you're doing for here. It is great to be here, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to represent you up in Montpelier. But there is a downside, and it's, I'm away from here. I'm away from family, I'm away from friends, and I'm away from events like this. And when the sun starts getting higher in the sky and the snow starts to recede, I'm away from my garden, too. And uh, for me, my garden is not just where I grow flowers and food, but it's where I connect with sacred space. And uh, here's something that I wrote talking about that. Anybody wants me, that's where I be. Anybody wants me, I'll be in the garden, in the garden naturally. In the garden naturally. I go to the garden to rest and recreate, to make some sense when. Life is a chaotic state I could be thinning carrots Maybe picking peas Or worshiping the goddess While I'm down on my knees Then anybody wants me I'll be in the garden Anybody wants me That's where I'll be Anybody wants me I'll be in the garden in the garden that you only live In the garden that you only The garden to the heart of the sky. Our hearts are in the seeds and stretch up high. Up from the earth we feed more than just a plate. There's nothing like growing your own for a taste better than great. So anybody wants me, I'll be the garden. Anybody wants me. That's where I'll be, anybody wants me, I'll be in the garden, in the garden naturally, in the garden naturally, in the garden naturally, in the garden naturally, the garden naturally. Not least, we 
have Don Harlow. Um, when I think of Harlow's Sugar House and Harlow's Strawberry Patch, I remember as a really young kid, umpteen years ago, uh, Don's Uncle Frank picked a bunch of us kids up in Putney and we picked strawberries all day long for two cents a quart. <laughs> and my best day was a hundred quarts. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a lot of money. That was a lot of money then. And uh, uh, most that's what I think of of Harlow's mostly. But we have uh, Don, who's an old time Vermonter. He's going to give us a few tips about who knows what. <laughs> but um, we think of maple syrup and Harlow's uh, and uh, apples and raspberries right now. And uh, if you haven't had any fresh strawberries and raspberries, get over to Harlow's. Uh, so here's Don. I think he's got me wired for sound. <laughs> I'm a vocal guy. I probably don't even need this, but uh, uh, farming. George D. Aiken. How many remember or knew the name George D. Aiken? Of course, we all did. This was George D. Aiken. It was Putney Nursery, and George D. Aiken was a figure in Washington, but we're proud to have him as a Putney figure. He was famous for his raspberries. Um, he uh, <clears throat> promoted a raspberry variety that is still with us. It's a good hardy raspberry and uh, it picks a good crop. It has good flavor and I'm tickled to death to still have some of the plants in our raspberry planting. But anyway, this, uh, this was Putney Nursery, right? Here, down, where are we? Down, and Route 5 didn't go down through. There was a dirt road that went down to the railroad station. But Putney Nurse was here, and George D. Aiken grew fruit crops. And my Uncle Frank was a, a good colleague of, of George Aiken and George Darrow and others that had good names for fruit crops in Putney. And likewise, Harlow's started growing fruit crops. And apples, strawberries, raspberries, blueberries, tried grapes. <laughs> and uh, we have continued that. Oh, I said, uh, well, won't be too darn long for it'll be 100 years. And um, fruit crops are fun. I tell people it's fun to grow fruit. We don't do it for the fun of it. We do it to make a living. <laughs> and without that in mind, it's hard to keep going with a farm. See, I keep saying farm. Uh, we are an orchard, but I like the word farm. And I'm tickled to death to keep on farming. <clears throat> and I've had, I have five sons, so I'm sure out of one of the five will continue to keep farming. And, uh, <clears throat> Our crops have been primarily oriented towards people coming to the farm, which is fun. Sometimes they get a little under my skin when I see them going crossways to the row. I oh, God damn it! I planted the rows that way, not go that way. Pardon my expression, but <laughs> what did I plant the rows that way for? And uh, but my son Doug is a little more taller than I am. He says, Pa. Go we'll find something to do. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to do it anyway. And, uh, but it is fun to have crops, fruit crops, oriented towards people coming. And apples, of course, in the fall, late fall. Uh, now we have apple crops that last from August all the way through to October. And there's some new varieties that are kind of exciting. I think Margaret likes some uh, Honeycrisp. She's smiling. <laughs> honey crisp is a new one that uh, it's just what it is. It says honey and it's crisp. It stays crisp a long time in a fruit bowl on the table at home. And it just has a, uh, a good aromatic flavor and people love it. So I'm glad honey crisp came along for I got done growing apples. One of them, the Macown apple, which came along 
most of you remember McCown is still known there, tremendous apple. They got an aromatic flavor, a good flavor, and they do say crisp in a fruit bowl too. And God knows the old traditional Mac. How are you going to get rid of a Mac? <laughs> They're good for everything. They're good in a pie. And even Margaret makes a darn good pie, but it's easy for her because she uses a Mac. <laughs> and uh, there are other apples that make good pies too, but uh, uh, the Mac is the old traditional apple for New England, Vermont, whatever. And all the newer varieties that come along, they survive somehow. And even some that we only have a few of that were the old-fashioned apple. I'm trying to think of the early green apple, yellow transparent. And not many people ever heard how he knows what they are. Uh, yellow transparent, golden delicious is another one, which is the later fall one. And uh, lots of different apple varieties. But to get back to this time of year, strawberries are fun. Uh, it's fun to have strawberries to pick. People like to pick strawberries. And uh, we have farm stand, a route that we take to deliver our fruit to. And they always holla, 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 when the strawberries going to start? But we are doing strawberries. And then we've started a few raspberries already. And uh, raspberries are so delicate. And it's not so hard to find people, pickers, like maybe the was at Europe, not so many, then of uh, the kids years ago that we had, heavens, we used to go around Putney with an old station wagon, and there was always kids that Marilyn remembers. She's smiling. <laughs> she picked strawberries for Uncle Frank. And then we had a Westminster route where we got kids and uh, picked our raspberries, strawberries, and things. And they went to Westminster to a, to a Williams Brothers produce that... that uh, What's 30 mean? I got 30 more minutes? <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, uh, fruit crops are fun. Uh, we'd love to have people come to our farm and enjoy the fruit crops we grow. So thank you. So I want to thank all of our storytellers tonight. Um, you know, Don was saying, I love to farm. Uh, we love our farmers here in Putney, and we want to support you, uh, and we want to uh, encourage everyone to eat as locally as possible uh, so that we do support our farmers. Uh, what I want to do before we close is just give you two minutes and turn to the person next to you and talk about what is one gift that you're taking from this evening. What is one gift that you're taking from these stories that people have shared with you? So find a partner and just talk about that for about two minutes. <laughs> storytellers to stand up and let's just give them an applause. Okay? Thank you very much. If you could pick up a chair and put it on the rack, that's always very helpful. And thank and, you for coming. And put the songbooks over on the library.